everyone assembles here, just a reminder, tonight we have a really interesting social happening at the USS, on the USS Midway. Yeah, USS Midway. So just a reminder to, to uh, come out there and see this massive ship and all the interesting things they have to show us. I heard there's some great flight simulators and whatnot, so it should be, should be pretty cool. So. Well, that's a massive clock. Uh, um, so, welcome to Nanog 54. It's kind of it's kind of nice to be up here and not be the program committee chair. It's like nice to have somebody else have that job, uh, but it's still nice to see all the uh, all of the folks out here. So it's great to see you all here. So this panel is on OpenFlow and the related technologies. We got. Um, quite a few inquiries and decided we'd try to do a panel on this. We had a couple of talks last time. Um, and this particular panel uh, is, is supposed to kind of be driving at, you know, the difference between fact and fiction and what's real and what's not real. So we have um, three, three people who are active in the industry. We have, let's see, who we have, we have Guido, uh, see so if I can get right, the last name right, Apple, F, how, do you, how do you pronounce your last name? Appenzeller, okay, so there you go. He's a CTO of Big Switch, which is a, um, a, a, one of the startups in the space. Uh, Ed Crab Google and Kirk Beckman from uh, Brocade. And, and all of these folks will give us a different or sort of their view of what, um, what the state of the art is, where this is going, and what, what the difference between fact and fiction is. So now all we have to do is figure out. So I guess we're going to do it Guido, Kirk, and then Ed. So how do we? Cue the slide, the slide decks. Can you do that? And then, I guess this is the device. Huh? Wow, this is fancy. So you can. Eat, would you like to get up here? All right, uh, super. Can you hear me? Thanks. Um, so, when I put together my slides, trying to answer uh, the question, what's what's real and what's virtual about OpenFlow. The, the actual the first thing I did was, was go back and ask, when did we start this whole thing? And uh, if you, I'm not sure if everybody can read this, but if you look at uh, the, the OpenFlow website, the first draft of the OpenFlow spec was actually published in November 2007. And if you read further, it, it says there's a little footnote that the final spec is, is expected for early 2008. The actual OpenFlow 1.0 spec was actually published uh, in uh, you know, December 31st, 2009, so almost early 2010, so, so two years late. And uh, so I asked myself, well, how did it happen that it took so much longer than, than we initially expected, uh, the, the original designers expected? And I think for me personally, the answer is, um, I think building a centralized control plane, uh, which is essentially what OpenFlow is about, um, turns out to be a lot harder than we originally thought. You know, I'm, uh, I'm proud to say that during my time at Stanford, we figured out ways to melt down the network that at least I had not previously thought about. <laughs> um, and, um, but I think the good news is that th the end of this process of uh, figuring out how to build centralized control planes is that today we have a rough architecture uh, for OpenFlow uh, that is emerging and that seems to be working pretty well. And the architecture is shown here. So, so to build an OpenFlow-based system, we basically have three major pieces. We have um, the data plane, so these are switches. Uh, it can be software switches or hardware switches. For this talk, I'll mostly talk about hardware switches um, that basically are enabled with the OpenFlow protocol. Uh, we have a controller platform that basically talks to the switches and exposes an API uh, up on top to the applications running on top of it. And then we have applications that actually provide the new interesting services in the network um, that we want. So for this talk, I'm going to keep it fairly simple. Uh, I just want to talk about sort of our perspective and what we're seeing for the data plane, for the switches, uh, for the controller platforms, and for the applications. So again, a little bit of history. Um, here's sort of a rough timeline of the OpenFlow specification you know, from 2007 to today. Uh, OpenFlow 1.2 actually has been approved by the Open Networking Foundation, but it's currently an embargo period uh, where it's not public yet. You know, that, but that should uh, change in the next month or so. Um, you know, if, if you, in parallel to the standards development, look at how switches uh, have been developed. Uh, you know, in, in mid-2008, we started to do first research demos. I think the, the first ones were NEC, Cisco, Juniper, uh, and HP. You know, in, in 2010, we started seeing the development of these, uh, of these implementations move out of research lab, out of universities, more into the, the development units of, uh, of the switch vendors. And then um, it was only in uh, early, um, actually it was, was mid last year, uh, you know, in May, that NEC as the first company 
offered a, a generally available uh, OpenFlow switch, uh, followed by IBM um, late last year and then HP early this year. So we only have been building uh, you know, generally available OpenFlow switches for about uh, six months now. Um, the really interesting question is what's going to happen next, and uh, you know I think the best is still to come. Uh, I think over the rest of for the rest of this year we'll see a number of additional vendors uh, come with their switches, and, and I'm very very excited about what, what I've seen in, in the product pipelines uh, of, of some of the manufacturers there. To give you a brief overview of what can OpenFlow switches do today, uh, so the most common OpenFlow switch um, we have is sort of a pizza box top of rack type design. <coughs> Uh, it comes in, in 10 gig or 1 gig flavors, so high density 10 gig, 48 ports or 64 ports, you know, many ports of 1 gig. Um, there's also a modular, mo uh, a small chassis switch available from HP, uh, the, the 5406. Um, in terms of capabilities, um, these switches typically implement most of OpenFlow 1.0 with, with a couple of uh, caveats. Uh, so this means they can match on a layer 2, layer 3 headers and TCP port. Um, we have basic rewriting capabilities. They typically all support L2. Uh, L3 support is limited. Specifically, we don't have a mechanism for TTL decrement yet, which, which limits um, use, uh, how useful they are for, for routing. And the flow table size, meaning the number of open flow rules you can actually put in one of these switches, uh, is, is typically less than 10K entries. Um, the, the one exception being the NEC switch that has an external TCAM, so it can go up to about 160,000 entries. And um, all of these switches uh, are, are hybrid, uh, meaning there's an existing uh, switching uh, 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 stack, you know, a normal software from the vendor. In addition to that, um, there's an OpenFlow stack on it. Um, there's one exception, which is the white-branded switches sold on the Pronto label. Um, they basically where you can put OpenB switch or Indigo, so open source implementations on it. And at that point, uh, you, know, you get a pure OpenFlow switch that really has no other way uh, to control the switch. And all of them have, you know, these are switching chips, so they have very small buffers. So as of today, there's four different vendors that will basically sell you a, a, an open flow switch, um, if, if you ask them. Uh, I've personally seen about 15 different hardware vendors demo open flow switches at, at different points in time. You know, my prediction is the number of commercially available uh, open flow enabled hardware will definitely double this year, but, but probably grow even faster. So this, this should be a very exciting year for, uh, for the open flow community. The next thing you need to build an OpenFlow system is an OpenFlow controller. If you look at a controller, it basically has, has two, um, two fundamental APIs you care about. Uh, the southbound API, it talks to the switches, or the, the network elements, and uh, that talks to the OpenFlow protocol. You know, more generally, these controllers are often SDN controllers, so they might talk other protocols um, to, these, to these switches as well. Um, and then there's a, a northbound API. Basically, what the controller tries to do there is to provide uh, an interface to applications sitting on top of it that represent the entire network and not each network element individually. So for example, I can query this API to say, please give me the entire topology of the network, or find a path, the shortest path from A to B, you know, or uh, set up a flow from, from, from a source to a destination. So basically, I can reason about the network as a whole. Uh, a lot of the complexity of the controller platform is basically figuring out how to build a distributed system uh, you know, with eventual consistency guarantees that, that then exposes a certain set of, of these, these unified uh, you know, centralized APIs um, to, to the top. Um, today, if you want to try out OpenFlow, there's a number of open source controllers that are, that are pretty interesting. Um, you know, I have a list here, and you can read faster than I can talk. Um, you know, they, they differ in terms of languages they're written in, in terms of licenses. Um, the, you know, uh, as, as a shameless plug here, you know, we are actually commercially supporting Floodlight, which is one of the, the OpenFlow controllers written in Java. And it's fairly high performance, used by a number of companies uh, for their products. If you're looking for commercial controllers, the, the big differentiator between what's currently available as open source and, and as commercial controllers is typically that they, uh, the commercial ones have another a couple of features which you'll probably want for, for a large deployment, such as a high availability, meaning you can run with multiple nodes, scale out. Uh, in some cases, um, you can actually uh, have partition tolerant controllers that you can basically run across multiple data centers that'll continue to function you know, if, if, uh, if the, the, the links between the different failure domains um, go down. Um, you know, the, to the extent that I can tell, we currently have a couple of mid-sized deployments running for about a year or so uh, with production traffic um, that's growing. You know, we'll, we'll, see, we'll see more of these um, um, appear this year. And um, there's a, so if there are differences in controllers, some of the controllers only work with switches from the same vendor, while other controllers, they, they will work with, you know, a variety of different uh, switch models from different vendors. So. Uh, Last but not least, let me talk about what are the use cases, what are actually the applications that are sitting on top of this. I think 
if there's something like a, a killer app for OpenFlow, from my perspective, it's probably network virtualization. I'd be curious to hear what, what the other speakers are thinking. But um, you know, the, the, the basic use case there is that you have a virtualized data center. You, know, you basically have racks of, of, uh, of servers, either virtualized or not, um, where basically you have multiple tenants and you want to take a subset of hosts, either physical hosts or, or virtual machines, uh, put them on a separate network, you know, isolate that network, um, you know, create, a, create a separate broadcast domain, potentially deploy a particular service model on top of that, um, and then basically create this, this virtual network or virtual switch that you've created, delegate that out to one of your tenants. Um, you know, it's, there's, there's several companies working this use case, and uh, it seems to be a pretty broad interest um, you know, from, from customers uh, in this across both enterprise and, and service provider. The other thing you can do with an open flow controller is you can write your own applications. Uh, so here's a, a little bit of pseudocode um, you know, to show, show what you can do here. In, in general, programming your network directly with OpenFlow tends to be hard because you still have to talk to every, uh, every separate uh, network device uh, you know, individually. You have to basically worry about what if they go down, what if they reset state, you know, and make sure that, you know, what, what about um, you know, making sure you converge in terms of the, the intermediate state that you're gathering. Um, with SDN, with the, the control platform, it becomes a lot easier because now you have a centralized API which can query about the state of the entire, of the entire network. So here's a little bit of pseudocode, for example, if you want to um, essentially set up, uh, you know, take a flow between two end hosts and, you know, map it to a different priority queue in your network to, to give it some QoS guarantees. You know, in, in general, that's a hard problem because you first have to find those hosts. You know, if you have lots of switches, you may or may not have infrastructure in place to find it, find it automatically. Then you have to determine paths and so on. With OpenFlow, you can potentially do this much, much easier by basically directly querying the controller platform and saying, where are these hosts? And you know, give me a shortest path between them, and now I'm basically just insert flow table entries that will forward this flow uh, along this path. Um, and you know, then you can subscribe to an event basically saying, you know, I, I want to get all notifications if hosts move, so if, if I see a host move on the network, in that case, allow me to, so I can recompute you know, what's happening in my network. This is a gross oversimplification, but I think you get the idea of, of what's possible with, with this platform. So last but not least, in order to get a little bit of discussion going here, I thought I'd make some predictions for what we're going to see this year. Um, you know, I think in 2012, my guess is most switch and router hardware vendors um, will announce an open flow or at least SDN strategy of, of some type. Um, you know, of those vendors, I think the majority will actually have devices uh, available, uh, generally available in the market. And uh, you know, I think we'll also see a, a fair number of, of mid to large scale deployments that, that become public. Uh, in, in, uh, primarily led by initially by data center deployments, but then going beyond that. Thanks. What I was yikes, sorry. What I what I was thinking would do would kind of like aggregate all the questions for the end. So unless somebody has questions right now, um, we'll just go on to the next speaker and we'll get them at the end. So, Kurt. Thanks, Dave. Uh, this is my first Nanog, and uh, I'm glad to be here. And I was lucky enough to run into Bill Norton at the airport, and uh, he shared his internet peering book with me by way of welcoming me. And he's got a little anecdote about what happened uh, actually at this end of the flight uh, in the book. So uh, stop by and talk to him about that. It's, uh, it's a little bit entertaining. Yeah, we, we're going to need the. Uh... You want to go next to Ed? No. Uh... They're switching over now. Yeah. Can you guys swap the decks? I do, I do pretty much agree with Guido's predictions. Not overly bold, but appropriate for the market, but we'll see, maybe, uh, maybe I'll be wrong too. All right, so here are my slides. Uh, my name is Kurt Beckman. Um, I'm with Brocade. Draft slides, well, I changed this. I wonder if these are the slides I thought they were, but uh, let's, let's find out. Uh, so first I wanna to touch on the conventional wisdom about OpenFlow. Um, we get uh, a lot of uh, contradictory uh, statements out here. So Scott Shanker, one of the fathers of OpenFlow, uh, there are several fathers, uh, said more than once, OpenFlow doesn't let you do anything new or anything that you couldn't do before. And you think, really? Well, if that's true, you know, why would I care? Why do I care about OpenFlow if, if I can't do anything new? But his, like his next sentence was to say, but it does give you a programmatic interface. 
So if you're an independent software developer, now you can do something that you couldn't do before, and that's kind of interesting. Or if you're a network operator that has the capability of coding, you've got developers, now you can do some new things. Sure, if you're a, a switch developer, uh, like Brocade, um, OpenFlow doesn't let you do much new. But the interesting bit's in that programmatic interface. Uh, it enables all kinds of possibilities. And uh, in a number of these other uh, meetings, you'll see people talk more about the possibilities. Guido mentioned the virtualized networking in the, inside the data center. Uh, you can virtualize networks outside the data center as well. There's, there's uh, a number of applications, uh, traffic engineering and so on, and hopefully Ed will talk more about that. I, I'm not going into a lot of the applications. So that's what you can do, sort of. Um, as Guido mentioned, most people are uh, adopting one, have adopted 1.0. 1.1's not getting a lot of adoption. Um, 1.2 that'll come out in a few days really, uh, come out of embargo. Um, there's not been a lot of commitments about it. People talk about it, but will it be adopted? It, it's hard to say. And there's reasons for that that I might talk about in a little bit. Uh, so OpenFlow today, the standard as it exists, there's lots of gaps. It's really early days. And so uh, it's not today's versions of the standard that enable this, but it's the idea of OpenFlow that enables these things. So historically, we've, we hardware vendors have controlled the software, um, and we've paid for the software development um, through selling hardware. Uh, and that has constrained the, the pace of innovation. So um, when soft switches became part of the game uh, a few years ago with hypervisors and so on, that altered the game a little bit. Um, and now OpenFlow uh, alters it in a bigger way uh, as, as vendors adopt it. So we can expect to see much more rapid innovation uh, going forward because we'll now be iterating at a software kind of a pace um, instead of the, the hardware, you know, every six to nine months you get a new release. So good news, bad news. Software-defined networking, of which OpenFlow uh, is a prominent part, it gives you the power to do whatever you want. You know, and of course that uh, naturally means that you don't have enough rope to hang yourself if, if you're not careful. So be careful. Um, and the number of interesting applications is huge. Well, that's good news. There's a big market. But on the other hand, in the standards body, it means there are a million voices. And it's hard for us to, to prioritize and figure out how to implement because the right thing for somebody is the wrong thing for somebody else. And so things go a little bit slow. People like to use the compute stack. Oh, we've got this really sweet compute stack. It's nicely layered. We've got vendors uh, competing in every aspect of that compute stack. Uh, wouldn't it be nice if we do that in networking? It's a familiar framework and helpful, but um, we're not in the same position. Uh, we don't have the equivalent of an Intel yet, and uh, actually lots of other differences. Um, you know, uh, it's much more widely deployed than computing was when um, the compute stack was developing. So we have this legacy of uh, existing hardware that OpenFlow wants to work on, and that, uh, that kind of complicates life a lot. Um, so we need to, to figure out how we're going to move to that um, networking stack, uh, given um, where we are in, in uh, the life cycle of networking. So uh, one thing I like to do is talk about expectations. It, it really bugs me when, when we can't deliver on expectations, because the expectations are just so far out ahead of reality. So I, I'm doing a couple slides on that here. So there are some contradictions that you often see in here, because uh, people are working in different time scales. There's the time scale of, can I buy something and I need to plan for that? And then there's the time scale about, oh, there's the future and I want you to be excited about this open flow thing and, and support it and, and express interest so that vendors pursue it. Um, open flow 1.0 and 1.1 are pretty limited. 1.2 is, is added some stuff, but it also has gaps. Um, IPv6 was missing from those first two versions. There's a little bit more in, in, uh, in 1.2. High availability is not part of the spec. People have implemented it, but it's outside the spec or beyond the spec. Um, configuration is now coming up to speed, but it wasn't in those early ones in Topology Discover, and you can go on. There's just lots of stuff missing. There's a lot of cool demos. Uh, I'll show you a link later on. Um, people are demonstrating this, but there is really either a constrained environment or maybe they did some extensions or they're operating a little bit beyond the spec, et cetera. So a lot of this cool stuff is its definitely going to come. I mean, I'm a believer in, in OpenFlow. Uh, and is it within your planning horizon? Well, it depends on your planning horizon uh, and sort of what problem you're looking to solve and when. Um, ONF is, you know, 1.2, as we said, is coming right out. And 
uh, one three and one four will be out later this year. So they're they're taking a little bit different approach to uh, standards development. It doesn't come out when it's ready necessarily. We're trying to push to deadlines and. Uh, that's getting us to be more productive, but um, some things often miss the uh, the deadlines. So uh, uh, it's coming out kind of um, chunky. So we've had some V6, but missed some other V6, for example. Uh, and w there's going to continue to be more uh, useful stuff added. Uh, Guido sort of mentioned, uh, well, both of us, the um, hardware developers are mostly running on 1.0 version of the spec. There's some aspects of 1.1. Well, I think it says that. I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit, sorry. Uh, 10,000 foot view, let's step back from the, the ones and zeros. Um, right now we don't have certification. The, there is a testing working group. Um, we're gonna have a plug fest in a few weeks and, and that'll get somewhere, uh, get us somewhere, but it's still not the same as conformance testing. Um, that's also being worked, but it's a little ways off. So prior to that stage, interoperability isn't guaranteed at all. So. Um, the way you provide a solution is you partner with folks. And so as, a, as customers, either prepare to, if you're gonna write your own controller, prepare to partner with a switch vendor. If you're gonna buy a controller, you're gonna have to uh, sort of work with two companies to do that. You don't just go get a, uh, you know, mix and match, I'll get one of these and I'll hook it up to whatever I feel like it. So, and the, you also may not find the app that you're looking for. If you're gonna uh, write your own application, you don't care, but uh, then you still wanna know, okay, well, which of the switches that can do what I need it to do. And uh, also, uh, there's been a lot of talk about how OpenFlow is just gonna commoditize the switch and really drive down pricing. But in the near term, um, switch vendors are taking existing switches and adding some OpenFlow uh, interface to it. So that means it's incremental, in incrementally more work, not less work. It's not gonna drive down the cost in the near term, especially when you don't have uh, uh, strong interoperability and, and competitiveness in, in that way. Uh, in the medium term, we'll get a lot more interoperability. Basic applications, whatever those are, uh, should be able to work on more than one box. But um, the more interesting applications will probably require additional extensions or answering questions that kind of go beyond what the spec can answer. Um, and, and so even with certifications, they'll still be partnering in order to delivering, deliver really interesting applications. And uh, also, you will see vendors um, focusing on um, specific application spaces. Uh, they can't take on the whole market, it's a, or the whole potential market. It's, it's just too big and, and there's too much going on. Uh, and then in the longer term, interoperability will be much less of a problem. I expect this, you'll see some co consolidations and there'll be you know, um, big and trusted vendors in the space. And, and you probably, you know, uh, if you're not in a real tiny niche, you'll probably be able to find the applications that you want and, and get some interoperability. So uh, a lot of people ask, how can, how can you engage um, in OpenFlow? I mean, what are, the, what are the different ways you can participate? And uh, you, well, it sort of depends who you are, of course, and I decided I'd slice that space um, in terms of how many resources you have and, and what kind of challenges you face. Uh, and that's not a very, um, uh, not this whole space is interesting. There's, there's only some of these spaces that, that really make sense. If, you, if you're underwater in terms of resources and at the cutting edge, you should just bail. Um, you're not gonna be able to accomplish much. So um, that's not a realistic space. And in the other corner, um, you have tons of time and, and you're not, uh, not very much demanding environment. I don't think very many people in this room are in either of those corners. It's gonna be more along the diagonal. If you haven't got any resources uh, in your, and uh, you've basically overloaded, you got some challenges, but you're overloaded, then skim the uh, blogs uh, during your minimal lunch time. Otherwise, watch the demos, and this is uh, the URL. The, you can go to openflow.org. There are good demos there that give you a sense about um, what the uh, uh, applications are, the potential applications that people have been thinking about, and, and they're, they're quite interesting and diverse. Uh, and you can read the, uh, the specs that are posted online, they're quite readable. Uh, Guido posted the 1.0 version. Um, 1.2 will be, I think, posted, uh, as I said, in the next few days. It, it exists and nobody's been talking about um, fires burning with uh, issues during the embargo, so that should be up shortly. After that, you can do an open flow tutorial. Uh, it's online, there's a link there. Um, and all the materials there, and, and it runs in a um, 
hypervisor uh, on your laptop if you want. So in terms of resources, it's pretty easy to, to go through that. I've done it. And it's nice to do it um, at one of the meetings where there's a bunch of experts wandering around, but you can do it on your own and, and pretty well make sense of it and get a, a feel for uh, what this open flow is, is currently able to do today um, and not necessarily where it's going. And then you can take and expand that if you've got more resources and, and it's more interesting to you because if you're out in the bleeding edge is where open flow gets interesting because that's where the problems uh, are not solved as well as you would like them to be. Um, then if, if, if you're more time and more um, more challenges in your environment, you should get that stuff in your lab, uh, get some units and, and uh, put it through its paces. And as Guido said, there's um, customer, or sorry, vendors that, uh, several vendors that offer stuff for sale today. And I think some other vendors, the one I know of in particular, that you can get stuff in your lab even though it's not technically for sale yet. Um, and uh, then you can become active in ONF. Of course, that, I've got you over on the right side of the resources there. That means you can write the check. Um, and uh, it's not a huge check. Some, some customers are able to write that check. Uh, beyond that, then deploy it in a, in a pre-production or uh, a pre-standard thing in production. Uh, and then if you're really bold, you can write your own application. And I think this is, that was the, la no, okay, good. I will add slides. So these were the draft slides. I submitted more slides uh, last night, but um, we ended up with the ones that I submitted three weeks ago. Uh, I, I do want to say a couple things about um, 1.1 and 1.2. So they added uh, 1.1 and 1.2. Uh, no, I'll take another step back to 1.0. 1.0 was a very simplistic model. A single sort of TCAM-like table was the assumption that, of what existed in the switch. And people could get clever about how they programmed that table and maybe loop back around that table, which is slightly out of the standard. But you could do clever searching and, and uh, or matching and uh, actions based on that. And most switches were able to support that, but it was complicated to achieve things because of that limited architecture. So 1.1, it added a couple of key things. It added support for groups, and it also uh, allowed for multiple tables with a mechanism to, do, to have a, a go-to action from one table to get to another table and do further matching and further actions and further go-tos and, and so on. Well, that was very powerful. You can do all kinds of things with that model. Unfortunately, it's much harder from a hardware vendor with an existing ASIC that was not designed for open flow to figure out, okay, so how do I take these requests, these table entries, how do I map that to my resources in my ASIC? I mean, I have many tables, but very often I do my lookups in parallel, and this thing's got its go-to, and I, I'm not even going to try. It's just too hard to, to figure out how to do that. And that same model exists for 1.2 and looks like it'll exist for 1.3. So. Uh, software implementations or NPU, uh, network processor unit implementations, are able to um, essentially emulate that. They're very flexible. It's not a problem. So you see it, one, one part of the uh, open flow world is comfortable with these 1.1 and 1.2 uh, implementations. And then hardware vendors like, like Brocade uh, look at that and kind of struggle. And so we just continue to use 1.0 and add an extension here or a, an addition there. Meanwhile, in, in ONF, there's a recognition that, that um, not, not both sides, not both kinds of switches, software and hardware, soft and hard, are, are um, sort of equally supported. And so there's a, a lot of uh, flurry of activity um, with bursts of progress toward uh, addressing that issue. And uh, I'm happy that we're making good progress. I wish we were making it faster, but uh, there will be um, some changes probably later this year that will uh, really allow the, the hardware-based switches to um, join the party in a, in a better way with, with full standards compliance versus the, uh, the kind of diversion stuff that they're doing now. So thank you, and I'll pass the baton back to Dave. So again, I think we'll, uh, unless anybody has any questions right now, we'll go to Ed, and then we'll do questions. All right, morning all, or not morning anymore. Um, so I am not trying to sell you anything. I work at Google. I uh, operate a fairly large network, which includes uh, a very large backbone and a number of very large data centers. Um, I actually don't think that OpenFlow itself is, is particularly interesting as a protocol. Um, I think that it is the leading instantiation of uh, software-defined networking. 
today. Um, and I'm certainly a big booster of it. We've been involved in it a, for a number of years. And you can do a lot of very useful things with it. And I'll talk about some of those in the abstract uh, in a little bit. But fundamentally, I actually um, think that we're over-focusing on OpenFlow, honestly. Um, and what we end up hearing from a lot of the vendors is that we're going to end up with this all-seeing, all-knowing set of applications with total global visibility of state, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's a good thing. I'm not against that. Um, some people are against making forwarding decisions that are not congruent with the actual forwarding path. I'm not one of those people, and we can talk about that later if you're interested. Um, but what we end up today, what we end up with today for OpenFlow is really something more like this. Um, which is, you know, it's a good costume, but um, it, it's not what you're being told necessarily. Um, so SDN in general is um, very interesting to us at Google. Um, and this is primarily um, because we run uh, in, in environments that are um, sufficiently scaled out that cost savings of between 5 and 20% <laughs> from a provisioning perspective, are quite large in terms of total monetary return, basically. Um, and so we have, to, we have to be very careful about how we provision state, what state goes in the network, how we use forwarding state in the network. Um, and we also have to be careful about how we use network resources. Uh, in general, you know, not, not to diss on any of our, of our wonderful vendors here today, but in general you're being overcharged for what's on your RE or et cetera, et cetera. Right? You, you just are. The technology is five years old. The CPUs are kind of underpowered. The amount of memory you're getting, it's all right, I guess, for your desktop five years ago. But um, by and large, you know, uh, you, you're being overcharged for this stuff. So this is, this is kind of why uh, SDN in general is, is interesting. So I'm not going to focus on OpenFlow for my actual presentation. There's plenty of material in the backup slides, and I think these are going to be published on the website if you're interested in the discussion of how we can actually take multidimensional flows, map them to hardware, et cetera, et cetera. And Kurt talked in the abstract a little bit about some of that with regard to the 2.0 work. I'm going to focus on SDN. Um, so basically, SDN, and I don't know actually how many people are familiar with it because I've been living in this very rarefied environment for the last two years where it's something I've been working on very closely. Um, the main thing with all of the protocols that implement SDN is that you're removing uh, distributed decision logic um, and uh, database uh, distribution mechanisms from the network elements. That's basically it. Um, all of the slides that, that Kurt presented and uh, that Guido presented are basically to that. You're moving state into the controllers and the applications, and you're pushing state down to the network, and you're only pushing the state down that you need. That's basically it. And all of them have the same thing. Now, a lot of the time people will make the argument that SDN is actually going to minimize the complexity, and that's true, but that's only true on the switches. So when we talk about this, we have to be very careful. Um, there's certainly a lot to be said for, for moving complexity off of these devices that are difficult to manage and involve a significant amount of irregular policy decomposition in order to do so. Um, and so moving that complexity elsewhere can have benefits, but you have to be careful when you're, when you're doing it. So the concept of SDN has been around for a long time, actually. Um, so Guido pointed out that um, the first version of OpenFlow was around in 2007, basically, inside of their group, published in 2008. Um, but well before that, there have been a lot of protocols that have attempted to do this, and they certainly make for interesting reading if you're actually following the space. Uh, I've included uh, a bunch of them here. Um, OpenFlow 1.0 looks a lot like FlowSpec, quite frankly. Uh, FlowSpec was never... Um, widely implemented or used, but Pedro did a good job, and it's kind of prescient in a lot of ways. Um, it also looks a lot like GSMP. Um, again, not something that most people here are probably familiar with, but certainly an uh, interesting protocol. Uh, these days, uh, SDN is instantiated really in, in three places, arguably, but really two, um, PCE and OpenFlow itself. Um, the difference here is that OpenFlow is pushing forwarding state directly to a hardware abstraction layer, 
uh, and is basically eliminating all portions of decision process and all bare protocols in terms of routing protocols. Um, PCE obviously is based on you having RSVPTE deployed, uh, ISIS, et cetera, et cetera, and so from the, the network element software complexity side, obviously that's, that's a bit higher, but it is readily implementable today because only your LERs are going to be running it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> so I have a timeline which it turns out is redundant because Guido had more or less the same thing. Um, I wanted to point out that the dumpy engineer is 1.1 for me. Um, and I wrote part of the, the spec, so I have to take full responsibility for that costume. Um, there are a lot of very useful features in 1.1, such as uh, MPLS, uh, tags, imposition, push pop, yada, 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 pretty basic stuff. But honestly, the protocol is still in its infancy. And even in 1.2, um, for anyone who's familiar with a well-designed routing protocol, you're going to notice a lot of inefficiencies and, and issues. So it's definitely a work in progress. And we're interested in promoting it, uh, and we're interested in getting it to a point where we can actually do the things we want with it because we can't do all of it just yet. If you want to talk about specific applications, um, come see me later. Uh, a lot of it is based around the 2.0 stuff, which is quite complicated, and I'm not going to put everyone to sleep with that because I'm sure that they're all tired as it is. Um, so why do we actually care about SDN? Well, I covered some of this uh, in the introduction, um, but basically it's cost because most of what I do um, is cost optimization um, with bounds for performance. Um, so from a cost perspective, um, there's CapEx, obviously, um, and I, I covered a little bit um, about why I think that we're paying too much for compute resources on, on routers, ultimately. Um, but that's not going to go for a, away for a while, as, as Kurt pointed out. Um, it's not like all of your distributed protocols are going to disappear and your vendors are going to sell you these awesome blades that run nothing but open flow. It's just not going to happen for a little while. Um, so what we do want to do is move the heaviest workloads off of these devices and um, make use of total network state as best we can. Um, so a lot of the times it's just not efficient to carry uh, really granular information about network state to all of the devices for obvious reasons. Centralization um, allows us to do some interesting things with that state and apply some pretty well-known optimization techniques to do things like cross-stratum optimization or better traffic engineering. Um, from a CapEx perspective, this means that I'm buying less physical plant, basically. Um, so unlike a lot of people here, I'm actually um, very into open flow in the WAN. Um, because I run a very large backbone network and there are a lot of inefficiencies with re regard to the way that traffic engineering works today. Typically people will over provision their networks to avoid the complexity and there's a whole argument there obviously about whether we even need MPLS, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, ultimately um, I'm, I'm trying to run my network relatively hot to within my performance bounds and I want to spend as little as possible. A lot of the time that's just not possible with today's northbound APIs and SDN OpenFlow and PCE both give me the opportunity to have a reasonable standardized northbound API to these devices to control forwarding state for better traffic engineering. Um, it also allows us to reduce interdependencies between protocols. A lot of the time you'll find yourself bending over backward to do something stupid with a routing protocol just because you need the state in there. And obviously you want to minimize that, but it would be better if we didn't have to bend over backwards at all. And so being able to do direct state imposition based on a regular rule set from some centralized location is obviously pretty helpful there. Um, the reduction of the complexity of distributed control systems on network elements is obviously a good thing too. I don't know how long everyone else takes to uh, test their code and get it approved for production deployment at this point, but for me it's a little while. Um, and so the less features I have to deal with there and the less complexity there is, the, the faster I can roll new code and the better it will be. Um, and then, of course, you can implement innovative new technologies on top of it. So this is basically the, the optimization techniques that I was talking about. You're able to design your own protocols. If you're into such things, obviously, there's a world of pain there for you to explore. From an innovation velocity perspective, which is primarily to speaking to the last point, um, being able to partition resources um, means that I can use pretty well-known um, development techniques in order to start to do basic software engineering for new protocols very quickly. Right now it takes me a long time to get a new protocol into a device. Um, I want to move faster. And that's my presentation.
Thank you. Well, that was like drinking from a fire hose. Um, anybody have any questions? Jake. Hi, Jake Kuhn, IP Infusion. So this is actually directed to Ed. And um, I was wondering what your opinions were in terms of, since you're now with the SDN model pushing state around the network from the control plane to uh, your forwarding elements, um, how that impacts things like dynamicism and the ability to recover from network failures. Um, are you seeing that as a potential obstacle that needs to be overcome? Is it going to, is it going to introduce problems? And also, um, how will this change in terms of pushing the hardware manufacturers, silicon manufacturers, to uh, for implementation of any kind of buffering of state tables or things to to take into account the the fact that you're now transferring um, a state across the network from a control plane. Is this for oh, me or was it for the group? I'm sorry. Was it generic for everyone or? Well, more towards Ed, but I guess anybody can answer. Okay, so I guess. Um, Obviously, if you're trying to do uh, some sort of fast local repair, it should be local. And you should be able to push the state for the local repair, i.e. the offline decisions that get made for what happens in the case of a failure down to the devices, but you still have to have a fast local control loop in order to affect this sort of thing. So honestly, it's a pretty trivial problem as far as I'm concerned. Um, it, it's, not, it's not a particularly big deal. Um, as far as the hardware vendors, I actually think it's too early to say what's going to happen there. I mean, it's not clear how well developed the open flow ecology, such as it is, um, uh, is at this point. Um, it's definitely an emerging market and people are interested, but I'm, I'm going to hold back and wait to see what adoption rates are like. Anybody else want to take a whack at that? Um, let's go here and then here. Uh, my name is LJ Wabker. I work for Cisco. Um, I do hardware and data plane design for one of the nine, for the 9KBU. Uh, one question primarily for Ed and one sort of for the panel. Um, for Ed, what I think I caught from the presentation was if your two big pain points are CapEx and the ability to do more granular traffic engineering within the data plane, and by traffic engineering I don't mean MPLS, I mean picking and choosing traffic and getting it somewhere. In the hardware world, those things are borderline mutually exclusive. So if you have to weight them against each other, where does that weighting come down? Uh, let, me, let me reiterate your question to, to make sure I understand it. You're saying that carrying additional state is, is costly? Yeah, the, the functionality to do more and more granular traffic engineering in the data plane is expensive. I disagree. And okay. um, the reason that I disagree is because it's based more on the network architecture than on the hardware. If you can, impl if you can impose addi additional encapsulation types that aren't necessarily even well-known protocols in order to affect this sort of traffic engineering, then I can reduce the total amount of state by doing effective aggregation, things like this, right? So. Okay, so there's, there's a significant component of uh, discipline in the network architecture. That yes, you're, that you're yeah, there has that to be, I mean, of, of course. You know, okay. I'm trying to protect my hardware as much as possible. Not, not, not everyone makes that assumption. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, also, if you're not involved in the OpenFlow 2.0 efforts, you should be just saying. Okay. And then for the panel, and that may be 2.0, to what extent is the spec planning on discussing how to make those trade-offs or at the very least how to get those trade-offs visible in the community? Because they do exist and at some point we have to choose A over B. And we're going to need help from the industry to figure out which is more important. Uh, Kurt is in charge of the 2.0 working group, and I'm going to defer to him. <clears throat> I'm going to ask you to hear that question again. I didn't, I was mapping it to a different thing, and so the 2.0 uh, support, yeah, say it again. Uh, to what extent does this, will, does or will the spec illustrate the fact that these trade-offs exist? and that as vendors we have to decide what things we want to build and as consumers the, the other folks have to decide which things they want to optimize around because at some point you won't be able to do both. Yeah, so the, obviously a very complex question here and I mean it's kind of beyond the spec to talk about those trade-offs exactly um, so much as to um, provide enough structure 
for people to move forward and enough freedom for people to do a lot of different things. And I think we're, we're moving in the right directions on that from a 2.0 perspective. I mean, I was hearing some discussion about the, uh, you were saying about the, the contradictions, and I have a hardware background, and I understand that's true, but if you look at, at um, I mean, maybe that affects gross margins, but if you look at the cost structures for, say, you know, network hardware vendors, there's a lot of costs that go in besides just the raw product costs, right? It's not just the, the cogs that right. determine what you sell something for. And conceptually, if you play that forward, if, if we um, are able to reduce the number of software enger, engineers we need and reduce the num amount of QA that we have to do and yada, 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 now you can talk about, and, and it's not necessarily us, right? There can be some upstart that comes along and produces something using a different business model and so on. So it, it, it doesn't necessarily have to change the, the raw you know, chip size, et cetera, in order to lower the cost of the overall product because it could be somebody who's operating in a much different business model and has different gross margins, right? Um, this stuff can be enabled by 2.0, and we don't have to, to, you know, I don't know, what would that be, section 4.6, trade-offs? No, I don't think we're going to have that. Okay, thanks. Yeah, just quickly to add to that, I mean, I think uh, the open source specification, if you look at it, its philosophy has always been just to define an API, you know, for, for the switch. It makes zero recommendations on how to build the switch, and in fact, it doesn't even sort of contain a functional model of how a switch should behave at all, you know, which to a certain extent is a problem, but I think we're light years away from, from giving you good guidance on what to do there. Yeah, I, I guess the, the, the message there is that you can totally blow up your devices if you mess it up. It's, you know, it's a loaded shotgun that you just pointed in your face. Obviously, you should be careful. Um, and you should, you know, talk to good vendors like Guido that are writing applications for you, hopefully, or at least uh, informing your choices there. So. Go ahead. I'm Jay Hennigan with Impulse Advanced Communications. Um, I certainly see some uh, powerful uh, benefits to OpenFlow as opposed to the conventional way of uh, configuring individual devices on a network. What I'm concerned with is how gracefully does it break. Um, if I have a switch that fails now, um, I have you know traditional things such as uh, HSRP VRRP spanning tree that will route around it. If my network can't get back to the mothership because the mothership is broken, and the only way it, need, it knows how to get back to the mothership is from the mothership, um, I suddenly have a complete meltdown that seems like it's going to be very difficult to get out of. I'm happy to take this one. Uh, I, I can conf we confirmed that experimentally. You can have very effective meltdowns uh, that way. So the, the general question. You can smoke there's, yourself. There's several at any questions moment. that 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 you need to solve. And one is the question of in-band control. Basically, if you forward your control traffic uh, over your data plane, you know, and then then you get you know since you have a number of issues. Some some are related to stability. Some are related to feedback loops. Uh, you know, there's there's a, a related some some uh, people that run SDN. Uh, actually using dedicated control networks or physically separate control networks. I think at this point we understand the problem space, we understand the trade-off of solving it, but you know, it's, it's a very real set of issues. Yeah, I mean, you, you really have a bootstrapping problem, right? And you, you have to bootstrap some level of topological awareness and awareness of controllers, et cetera, et cetera, whether it's via static configuration for whatever the topology is, because theoretically you have access to what that graph is and what the attributes are, or whether you're going to design your own protocol for discovery at this point. So all, all that OpenFlow does to reiterate is allow you to put state in the network. That's it. We also touched before about how we may want to have more intelligence in the switch than, than it, uh, it seems at first when we talk about, well, we're just going to abstract this all out to some external controller. Uh, and I think what happens under failure conditions is the kind of thing that, well, we probably want to sort some of that out in the switch. Um, and that, none of that's in the standard yet, right? Uh, and how much of it will go into the standard, I, I don't know. So we're, we're going to continue to be in this place where I think, you know, uh, Guido's firm and other firms and their partners like the hardware vendors will, will find ways to solve these problems. I mean, we're not unaware that these problems exist, um, but they won't be standardized. So you'll be in that partner uh, kind of a situation, depending on which problem you're doing. I mean, if you're running an open V switch, well, then you don't need a hardware vendor to, to produce that for you. But there's, it's, we need some maturity. Um, it's a bunch of interesting problems with a bunch of motivated people, motivated smart people working on it. But uh, yeah, be patient a little bit. Igor. Hey, uh, Igor Goshensky, Yahoo. Uh, so uh, Ed, you were talking about doing um, short control loops on local devices to do uh, fast local repair stuff. 
Um, what routing protocols are fairly good at is uh, dealing with a multitude of outages happening at once. So when you do a fast local repair that you pre-calculate ahead of time, you need to figure out how many things you're going to account for uh, locally. And you know, after you fail to account for all of it, then you go upstream. As opposed to a routing protocol running a switch that could say, all right, I just lost 16 links. Uh, you know, all possible local repair options that you pre-programmed to me are gone, but I do have you know, other really hokey ways around it because as long as my uh, you know, like struct graph is still intact, or at least if there's any feasible paths, I'll get to it. Where do you think you draw the line for number of faults that you pre-program local repair versus which you program, you know, willing to go talk to the mothership or, you know, at what point do you start saying, you know what, I want to put a lot more state in the local device than uh, in the rib of the local device for a uh, longer term control loop than a FIB sw switch over, but shorter term control loop than going to the controller? Yeah, so uh, obviously it's kind of a sliding scale there. Um, the further my controllers are away from the devices and the longer the decision algorithm takes to run, the more local state I'm, I'm going to have to program in order to account for these sorts of failures. But honestly, if a 16 links failed on a device, I probably want it to go away completely. Yeah, right? but it's so. not necessarily, you know, 16 links fail on one device. It could be that, you yeah, know, I, one I thought you were saying on and, one device there, yeah. but yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, obviously, like, if I, if, if, Hypothetically, I have a bad architecture, right? And uh, I have one controller for all of the United States, right? And um, I have a, several problems in one region, you know, and I have to deal with cross-country latencies in order to get failure information signals back to the device, run the whatever it is that's running, and then get information back. That's obviously suboptimal, and I'm going to have to take that into account and program additional state, so. I mean, I mean it's pretty clear that you know, a control loop that has duration shorter than the RTT between the controller and packet processing time in the switch is going to be hard to implement, right? It's kind of an upper bound. Tony. Thank you. Uh, Anton Capella, Five Nines. Um, first a response, I, I like the concept that there's a, a HAL in the, in the workings here to be improved for decoupling these two features of modern devices that we buy. Uh, it seems like someone's going to have an opportunity here to write some pretty innovative stuff with the control plane, and I can't wait to see what we get. Um, the other hand, I, I'm curious what you might all think about the, the latter part, what we could expect, um, and that is um, along the lines of uh, active networking. Uh, so for example, uh, we're talking about just programming stuff into control planes today. Um, of course, GE research hasn't been touched for like 10 years, but the concept is still in my mind that at some point, um, that this kind of division of computation and transporta transportation of the information itself becomes blurry. And maybe we ought to ask our, ourselves here, is there any interest in that? Did the future, if you will, working group participants yet to this date think about applications being closer to uh, these types of frameworks versus farther from them? What do you mean by applications? Uh, something to mangle. Uh, some sort of packet content. Yeah, uh, you, mean, you mean a network application? Uh, sure. I mean, it's one category of ABN, right? Yeah, so I don't know if, you, if you've seen the debates that are going on in uh, the SDNP proto list um, in IETF right now, but um, we should talk afterwards. Yeah. Sure. Anybody else? Oh, I meant, I meant this for the poll panel, if you could. It's okay. I think, I think it, it will get closer. I mean, I, Essentially, by creating this freedom, somebody's going to create a pathway to, to make those closer than they currently are. Uh, and is, is the market going to adopt it? Is there going to be enough value add in that? Um, I guess we'll have to see. Well, in, in your model, I guess to, to, to refine the question, do, does this look like a, a service, quote unquote, concept in the switch? Uh, arbitrary interface happens to route to some CPUs, or is there a more direct path inside this concept uh, to say redirect some traffic within the chassis to, a, say, an integrated? layer seven aware device or, or so forth. Like, like how, how do local services look to this model if, if that's even something you consider to be so, special or separate? So that's, a, um, I don't know if this is the right way to answer this question, but let me just try. Um, there's some work going on that's trying to do um, some kind of melding between what, you know, these off box control planes that controllers do and what uh, on box distributed control plane would do. So there are services that we know about today that might still be, might be able to coexist um, with these other services, and they might not look 
different or they might have APIs exposed. So the PCAE was an example that Ed gave. There's Alto. And there's, you know, any other arbitrary one that people want to do, right? So in some ways, there's this hybrid mode that's, uh, that's emerging that kind of is trying to address that. I'll be mindful. Thank you. Is that it? Anyone else? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, folks, for that excellent discussion on OpenFlow. Um, we have a survey giveaway for, from yesterday's survey. Again, a reminder that we're going to be giving away a uh, prize tomorrow and Wednesday as well. Uh, the only thing you need to do to get these wonderful prizes, well, two things. You need to fill out the survey, and you need to actually be here um, during the second session of the day, right after the break, the morning break, when we actually announce these survey winners. So. Um, uh, and I just want to remind you, with a sample set this small, there is a really good chance of getting something to go home with. Just fill out that survey, please. So for yesterday's survey, I'd like to um, hand this out to Jeff Houston. Congratulations. You know, J uh, Jeff actually impressed us with a, with a really... A really visually stunning uh, talk a couple of nanogs ago. What was it? I remember you, you like took pictures and you marked it up, so maybe you'll be able to see it. That was a Wacom tablet. Anyway, uh, 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 SoftLayer has um, has donated the uh, the giveaways for the surveys. This nanog. Um, we have a little bit of time before our lunch break, so we'd actually like to get Martin Levy Martin Levy up here for a lightning talk. Where is Martin? Hey, here he comes. Yeah. But a submission that we're able to actually uh, shoehorn in here.